Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? It's a funny room. I apologize for that. But it is otherwise a splendid venue on a splendid day. So thank you for all coming today. Uh, I'm Dave Shackley. Most of you know me. I'm a stand-in for our leader, Mr. Tolofari, who uh, has not been able to come today because he's on TV. He's on TV at lunch today in a program on Channel 4 called Steph's Packed Lunch. So uh, Molly tells me we might be able to stream this at lunchtime live from Birmingham. Is that right, Molly? Yes. Yeah. So um, if we can do that, we'll, we'll obviously let you know. So, so Sot's not here all day, so you've got me as a, as a stand-in. So I apologize for that, but hopefully we can uh, still have a great day. Can you hear us at the back? Yeah, excellent. So what we want today to be is a really interactive uh, session. We want lots of questions from the back from the sides, all types of people. This is a whole urology uh, conversation today. It's not just about medics or nurses or surgery or radiotherapy or whatever. It's about the whole cancer service we do in urology. We want a, a really good conversation today. So we've got some talks today that are really prompts to get a broader conversation going. I've got some kind of housekeeping bits to do. The first is you can see here there's some filming going on. So I presume you've all signed a waiver. You're all happy to be filmed. Yeah. Okay, but we, we are being filmed, so that's obviously good so we can share the content to other people later. Um, we do have um, a rep uh, room through there, and the re reason why the day uh, is working like this with, with these great facilities is, is partially because of the support from the pharma companies, three in particular, Ipsen, MSD, and Bayer. So if you could please go and visit the stands um, at the break, lunch, and then the break again this afternoon. Please go and speak to them. That will really help secure their support in future meetings. So, so thanks very much. Um, we do have, um, sorry about the microphone. We do have a, a couple of panel discussions as well. So I really want you to get some questions going there. We'll try and get a debate and a discussion going um, during those points. We've got one speaker who can't attend today, and that's Alex Hoyle, due to uh, something that's come up over the weekend. So he's giving the Tula talk this afternoon. So we do have a little bit of extra time, 20 minutes during the day. So um, if the sessions are slightly overrunning, that's because we're allowing it to, because we've got 20 minutes of extra time. I'm hoping to get you away uh, mid to late afternoon, um, if that's all right, about half past three, something like that. We do have uh, a trainee prize is that right? This afternoon, we've got three presentations, and uh, Maria uh, and me have been selected to choose the best presentation. So there will be a prize at the end of the day we'll give out to one of the three trainee presentations. Uh, so um, we're going to now start with our first session, and uh, the first speaker is Mr. Kieran O'Flynn. Most of you know him. Kieran is... Uh, basically he's held all the positions in BAUS uh, that you can possibly hold and the Specialist Advisory Committee for Education. Um, and at the moment, he's working for GERFT, getting it right first time. We're going to hear from Kieran about what he feels about the urology service, particularly with respect to cancer, and also the urology workforce, and what we might want to do in the future. And just before I bring Kieran up to the front, I, was, I don't know whether many of you attended BAUS or saw BAUS last week. But there was lots of presentations about lots of different things. But there was two facts that stuck out for me. Uh, the first was that for, this is not cancer specific. This is urology. For every 150 referrals in urology, there's 10 operations and one cancer operation. And I'll leave it with you that a lot of the debate and discussion and hot topics in Greater Manchester over the last 20 years have been about where and who is doing cancer surgery. And yet it affects such a minority of urology patients overall. And also, even the cancer patients, uh, a lot of them don't get cancer surgery. So have we overemphasized cancer surgery? I want to leave that in your heads all day and realize, do we need to tweak, change, do anything different as a consequence? Uh, the other thing was, uh, the other fact was that over the last 10 years, cancer surgery, cancer patients in urology and also general urology. We've had a workload increase in clinic of about 40 or 50 percent. We've had a 40 or 50 percent increase in emergencies and about 40 to 50 percent increase broadly 
in workforce. And yet the number of operations has stayed flat. So we're becoming more and more, it's the theme I was just developing, we're growing more and more non-surgical. We've got to have an offer for patients that's about diagnostics better, that's offering other treatments and other interventions and other follow-ups that isn't just about surgery. So I want you to just think about that. What's the workforce we need for the future? And how might we tweak <laughs> our urology services reflecting that maybe it's not all about cancer surgery? So with that intro, let me welcome uh, Mr. O'Flynn. Thanks, Tim. This is starting well. Right, good, good morning everybody and it's, it's lovely, lovely to be here. So um, in, I'm trying to think, it was November 2019, I was uh, appointed along with John McGrath as the GERF lead for urology. And GERF stands for the Getting It Right First Time. And it's a national program that was set up by Tim Briggs to try and improve medical care by reducing unwanted variation. And what I'd like to explore with you during the talk, and it's got a number of different themes, is some of the issues around the surgical provision, particularly in relation to urology. But I'm also going to talk about urology as a specialty and how it's developed and how it is going to develop over the next uh, few years. And some of the challenges that face us, particularly with trying to recover after COVID. So the purpose of GERFT was really to try and improve health and patient outcomes, deliver cost and efficiency savings, and promote the uh, best practice, and also support elective recovery. And over the past couple of years, John and I have uh, been looking at a number of different facets of the specialty, which I'll explain in some more detail. So we had a template to work from based on what Simon Harrison had done. So Simon was the first lead of GERFT and Simon visited all uh, 143 urology units during his tenure, about 2016, 2018. And you can see here, well, hopefully you can see it, that the thing that he put at the top of his list in terms of key recommendations in 2018 was to establish a training curriculum for urological nurses with accredited training departments. Has that happened? Well, the short answer is no, it, it hasn't. But the establishment of the GM Academy uh, goes at least some, some way towards helping us think about urological nursing, how we're going to train our nurses of the future and what it is they're going to be de delivering, because that's going to be hugely important in terms of the specialty moving, moving forward. So when we started, the idea was to look at variation in relation to how urology was going to uh, be delivered and what the variations were, and then how we might affect some changes with regard to how that was going on. And we felt that in terms of doing this, uh, we would go on tour and see the various different units in the country and learn from both medical and nursing colleagues about what was going on. And then COVID happened. So the tagline here is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And after the start of April 2020, basically activity, activity paused and we needed to redress our plans. So we really went away and had to think about the, uh, the specialty in, in some detail and what it was we wanted to achieve. And if you're going to make any comments on the specialty, the first thing to, is to appreciate just what an eclectic specialty it is. It covers quite a wide range, both of medicine and surgery. We, and I mean the collective here, deliver 2.8 million consultations a year. 40% of our referrals, they might not come in as two-week referrals, are predicated on the idea that the patient may have cancer. I would suggest to you that no DGH can function without some form of urological presence because 20-25% of the generality of surgery has a urological component, so it's pretty important. We know that delivery care is changing rapidly, and as David has indicated, he's taken all my best lines. Less than one in 12 of our patients who we see in outpatients will actually end up coming into hospital, either as a day case or for, for a procedure. We also know that as a consequence of, of the surgery, 
particularly for cancer, many of our larger centres are overheated. And as a consequence of being overheated, they cannot uh, deliver uh, the full cornucopia of urology. And for that reason, urology area networks, something that was initially proposed by Simon Harrison, we see as being potentially the way forward because no one trust can deliver all the elements of urology. So these figures here go to the heart of what David said to you at the, uh, at the start. If you look here, you will see the prostatectomy and nephrectomy in cancer in its various forms account for about 16,000 procedures in England. This is just England in a particular year. But look at the figure on the right. It's 173,000 procedures. So we've been consumed by the idea of cancer for urology over the last decade or two, but in fact, a lot of what we do is not major cancer surgery. And much of what we can do, it can be delivered in a, in a different way. So during the interregnum, before we actually got going with, uh, with the visits, we looked at what we thought might be key metrics for the specialty, based on the fact that 170,000 procedures would be delivered, but they would be delivered in lots of different ways. And so the 11 sentinel metrics that we chose were day case rates for men, for men receiving bladder outflow surgery, and that's because 24,000 procedures are done a year. We looked at emergency readmissions for patients with those procedures predicated on the idea that if they're being readmitted, then perhaps the pathways weren't working terribly well. And moving down the list, you can see day case rates for patients with bladder tumor resection and ureteroscopy, and there were a number of other things in there as well. And following on from doing those metrics, we, we put those all together and we got the information from Model Hospital. And then we went on tour. I'd love to say that we went on tour around the country, but that wouldn't be true. We went on tour on, on teams because we weren't allowed to visit lots, lots of different units. But we initiated the GERFT deep dives into urology. And essentially, we visited all 126 units in the country delivering urological care. And I said to you a few moments ago that there were 143 when Simon went around. So we can see that there's been a reduction in the number of units. And that tells us something, okay? So that urology is tending to coalesce somewhat into other units. And I'll come back to that in a little while. And as part of the visits, we sent every trust a pre-visit questionnaire. It may be a little difficult to read from the back, but one of the first things we asked about uh, was the nursing complement. So how many nurses people had and what it is that they were doing. So there was a 35 uh, section questionnaire on that to try and understand the major element of urological care that has been delivered by nurses and also to a smaller extent by physicians associates. And based on that, we provided then a provider level report. So all 126 trusts got a 90 page report that gave their hospital ratings for various things. Some issues around demographics, because no two hospitals in this country are alike. They're all different. We work in different areas. We have different demographic issues with regard to our population. And we have different workloads. We also asked about research and training, because we thought that research and training might be a good surrogate for how well a unit was functioning. And we also asked about the provision of emergency care, day case, and major surgery. So in terms of the visits, all trusts then got a pre-visit letter. We then conducted this virtual review of their, of their services and then reflected on that because context is everything and then issued a post-visit letter, sometimes with some recommendations pointing out where issues uh, might have occurred. And that was both advantageous in terms of the clinical teams working in the trust who said that management weren't engaged. And at other times with management saying the clinicians weren't engaged with what it is that we wanted, we wanted to do. So I'd like to show you this, which is kind of illustrative of some of the issues that we had. This is London ICBs and each of these bars represents a trust within London. I'm not picking on London, it was just the, one of the early ones out, out of the gates, okay? And so you can see, it's not all London, the top performing trust in relation to day case rate for bladder tumor resection in the country at that time was Gloucester, where they were doing over 70% of their TURBTs as, as day cases. If we look at the trust, now it's impossible to read this, and I don't expect you to do it, but I'm going to talk you through it. 
So I've blotted out the trusts here, but each of these vertical lines represents a trust, okay? And some of these trusts are co-located, so they're very close to each other. And top here, because I'll come back to the most, day case rate for bladder outflow obstruction. This is day case rate for um, TURBT, and this is day case rate for ureteroscopy. And if we look at these two trusts that are separated by less than four miles, this trust has a day case rate for bladder outflow obstruction of 0%. This trust, happens to be King's, is 62%. Why do we have that degree of variation, you might ask, perfectly reasonably. If we look at this trust again, you can see that they have a zero rate for bladder outflow obstruction, but quite a respectable rate, 36% for day case TURBT, and then an excellent rate for ureteroscopy. So over 80% of their patients were getting day case ureteroscopy. And all these were happening without compromising the good evidence, without compromising in terms of patient readmission or extended length of stay. So it can be done. So the lessons that you can learn from this, because this is writ large throughout the practice of urology, no matter what we look at, is that there is huge variation in terms of the care that we get. Variation is very expensive in terms of resources and money. And the underlying reasons for it relate to the culture of the organization, sometimes the facilities that the organization has, so lots of places that we've visited don't have proper day case facilities where can, they can do the work. Sometimes it's an issue of equipment. Finance always plays a role, but it's important and probably more important are the pathways that are set up in terms of managing patients to ensure that if you're getting patients home safely as a day case, because patients don't want to be in hospital, then that you have the mechanism that if they have an issue that they can talk to somebody and if necessarily be seen, be seen again. And that speaks to the workforce. So the question you might reasonably ask is, as a consequence of doing this sort of work, is practice changing? Well, we know, because statisticians tell us, that when you start to measure stuff, you inevitably see some form of improvement. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is that the day case rates for TURBT 2017, so these are the top decile performers, have increased and improved over the period of time. This relates to, to Salford, okay, in terms of what it is we, we've been doing. And we've been tried to be very active in terms of moving our, day, our TURBTs into day case procedures safely. But you can see that nationally, and this is the national figure, that that has improved as well. So some evidence that things are improving. I stole this slide from David, he doesn't know this, uh, a few years ago, but it's the concept that basically everybody, everybody's an improver. Everybody has the capacity to improve. And essentially, simply by showing people the data, you can start to affect that conversation in relation to what's going on and encourage people then to, to change. And when it comes to changing practice, best to spend energy really on the early adopters because energy ultimately is finite and people want to see an improvement. So what was the upshot then from, from seeing these 126 units? Well, what we know nationally is that we are short, severely short of both nurses and medics. Okay, so in relation to the medics, we probably are short about 120, 150 urologists nationally, and recruitment is a huge issue. And that's particularly true of units which have less than one in eight. Because if you're less than one in eight in terms of urologist, you're going to be on call more often, and being on call more often, you may not be sufficiently supported by junior colleagues. So you're in more at night. And that's a hassle. Why would you do that if you can work somewhere where you can work on a 1 in 12, 1 in 15, 1 in 18? What we also found was the role of the specialist nurses and the staff levels are highly variable. So we have banned sixes in some institutions doing high-level work in terms of flexible cystoscopy, Botox, and Tula, whereas in other units there are no nurses doing these procedures whatsoever. Hugely different. And that really speaks to nursing, nursing education. Okay, and bringing on our nursing workforce. 
We know that facilities differ hugely in terms of uh, outpatient wards and, and theatres, and that's for reasons that are both historic but also relate to the culture and the leadership in the organisation. And one of our significant issues in terms of recruitment into the specialty, particularly from, from nurses and the PA perspective, is the demise of the urology ward. Because you can't be what you can't see. So if you haven't seen the specialty, grown to like the specialty, there's quite a mature audience here, dare I say it? And as a consequence, my bet is that nursing colleagues here will frequently have started their careers seeing urological nursing in action, probably on the ward before morphing. With COVID, we've also seen a reduction in terms of, of ERAS, and we know that there are large gaps in the service related to female and functional. So I'd like to morph now into some of the issues around uh, theatre productivity, because what we know nationally is that theatre productivity isn't back to where it might be. And we still have large numbers of patients on waiting lists, waiting long periods of time. So some of the activity that have been involved is trying to Im improve on this uh, but underpinning these, uh, this idea of getting a better bang for your buck, because theatre is hugely expensive, is clearly waiting list validation, so understanding what's on your list and whether those patients need to remain on your list, getting our pre-op processes right, and really communication with the patients in, 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 a timely, in a timely fashion. And alongside this, because coming out of the work that we did, is this concept of right procedure, right place. So up and down the country, there are still examples of patients having local anaesthetic uh, transperineal biopsies being done in theatre under general anaesthetic, or continuing to have trusses, trusses done in theatre, flexible cystoscopy and Botox in theatre. And essentially, this is a waste of uh, facilities when these procedures can be done uh, well in terms of an outpatient setting. So you can see here a list of procedures that have are now being done on a routine basis in terms of outpatients. So Chula, which you're going to hear about this afternoon, transurethral laser ablation of bladder tumours, has been established basically in all GM hospitals with emerging evidence that, in fact, you can keep patients off inpatient or day case lists for TURBT or for diathermy. And the same is true of these other procedures here. Another thing that contributes to this problem is, uh, is our late starts. So I just thought I'd pay reference to this. And this is the late starts. This is uh, me washing my dirty linen in public. Okay, this is late starts in terms of the NCA uh, in, in urology. You can see we're kind of somewhere down here in terms of what's, what's happening. So these are late starts on average more than 30 minutes. All this has been collected um, through, through model hospital. It's all available. Anybody here, well, you all have basically uh, NHS addresses can access this information for your own trust. But you can see the huge variation in terms of that. And that to me speaks of the fact that we don't actually have our processes right. So there are myriad of different issues, but our processes aren't right. And as a consequence of that, we're not operating on a sufficient number, an adequate number of patients in each of our sessions. So in terms of the strategic direction for, for the specialty, uh, those of you who are interested could go on to, if you Google GERFT and then Google GERFT Academy, uh, you can see that we've written a number of documents which I'm going to allude to. This is called the Path to Recovery. And there are a number of issues in terms of the strategic direction. So one is move towards system working, okay, through urology area networks. So at, where I'm based at Salford, we do little now in terms of andrological care. We basically have a network model involving our colleagues from central Manchester. That works pretty well. At Salford, we're one of the early units to initiate the idea of a urology investigation unit. And that essentially uh, is the model that I think should be delivered throughout the country, but it isn't, it isn't at the moment. And the problems that we have currently out at, uh, at Salford Royal is that our urology investigation unit is actually a bit small for what it is we're trying, to, we're trying to deliver. We have morphed the specialty into more, more patients being treated as uh, day cases in terms of high volume, so HVLC, high volume, low complexity, surgical hubs. Here in Manchester, we have two. So one, one of them is at, uh, is at Rochdale. And behind all this, we need to think in terms of ultimately reducing the long-term uh, inequalities um, in, in the NHS and zero carbon. So we need to be mindful of that. We're, we're looking at that at the moment. 
So in terms of the recovery of uh, in urology after COVID, it strikes me that there are five, five different themes. I'm going to develop some of these over the last few, last few minutes. The first is our front-end pathways. The second is our follow-up reduction. So the request from DOH is that we reduce the number of patients that we're seeing in outpatients by about 25%. We've spoken about procedures in the correct setting. And then the oft forgotten stuff on the right, but as important as community services, catheter care and continence because we can't get people back into the community unless we have adequate resources and properly trained personnel who can deliver the work in the community. And the community, quite frankly, hasn't been looked after well enough. And allied to that then is allied and nursing um, care. So in terms of outpatient activity, this is, David alluded to this early, earlier on, this is the urology activity from 2010 through to 2021-22. So you can see that here we haven't quite, quite recovered. But what you can see is that there's a significant uptake in terms of virtual consultation. And by and large, the evidence would suggest that patients actually quite like, quite like that. And also, it stops people being on the road and is carbon, carbon efficient. In terms of new outpatient appointments, uh, you can see here once again running across from uh, 2010 or 2011, 2012 to 2021, 22, uh, we're still not quite back up to where we were prior prior to COVID, but we have significant issues in terms of uh, new outpatient appointments. And I think this figure on the right will likely go up uh, when we see the latest figures coming through. And then I referenced this earlier in terms of the urological workforce, uh, which has increased over the years, but it's probably going to remain pretty static and, in fact, is likely to decline unless we train more over the next couple of years. But what we do see is that there's a huge variation in relation to follow-up by trust. So each of these vertical bars here is a set one of the 126 trusts in England, and the variation is huge in terms of, the, of how many patients are being followed up by their uh, by their consultants or by their nursing, nursing colleagues. And once again, context is important because the one on the most right here is, is the Marsden, uh, so it's probably related to the cancer, cancer work. So what we can say is that the growth in consultant numbers over the past 10 years have been largely driven by increased outpatient and diagnostic work. So only 1 in 12, 1 in 14 of the patients that we see in the outpatient setting ultimately make it onto a list. And more and more of what we do no longer requires an inpatient bed. It may require a day case facility, or increasingly the work can be delivered in outpatients. So outpatients is pivotal to the specialty. We have had a recent growth in terms of the medical workforce, as you could see, but not necessarily an increase in medical productivity. And that's something that the profession is going to need to look at and was an increasing focus uh, last week at, at BAUS discussions around this. And we can remain with significant issues around productivity moving forward. So the issue for most of us will be some form of outpatient transformation. And I think I'd be a little surprised if you haven't heard about some, some of the rumblings around this over the, the last six months or so. And essentially, there are six pillars about outpatient transformation. So, and they're listed here. So, this is advice and guidance, okay? A lot of what we do is low-hanging fruit, so do we actually need to see the patients? Do we actually need to see somebody with irritative lower urinary tract symptoms if they haven't had some lifestyle modification or perhaps if they haven't had some medication? So, with regard to our patient, uh, with regard to these pillars, Advice and guidance, we currently have some national guidance uh, in development. So we asked Andrew Dickinson, who's a consultant in Plymouth, to get a, a group together to, to look at this. So the specialty is going to go down the route of having specific advice and guidance for lots of different conditions that we can all use. And the rationale behind that, irrespective of whether it's one of our nursing colleagues or one of the medics using advice and guidance, is that there'll be a consistency around it. And because there's a consistency around it and it'll be endorsed by um, both the nursing and uh, urological associations, association, then there'll be some, uh, some standby by, by virtue of that. And the same applies to patient-initiated follow-up. 
Now, we'd like to think that in terms of an efficient speciality, which has an emphasis on one stop working, so patients being seen and then discharged, PIFU may be less important than it is in other specialties such as neurology or, or dermatology, but important nonetheless. With regard to DNAs, we're bedeviled with DNAs in the specialty, so probably running in around 10, 10% or so, but that really needs formal um, trust support for that and confidence in the mechanisms that the trusts put in to enable to, us to discharge patients that perhaps don't need to be seen. I've referenced urological investigation units and then clearly the issue of personnel and our nursing workforce going forward is, is hugely important. So with that in mind, we have just published, just prior to BAUS, a guide to urological investigation units. And essentially, this establishes a case for change. So this is available on the Gerft Academy uh, location and structure. And the idea behind this document is that it's written for managers, uh, not just clinicians, managers and nurses, particularly managers, so that they could look at these particular issues and say, well, the clinicians are advocating for this. What is it that we need to put in place? So you might find that document quite useful. Because we sense moving forward that a properly functioning urology investigation unit will have all these, all, ultimately all these elements in it, it will be capable of delivering all these elements. Because if you're capable of doing all these things in an investigation unit, then you will consume less resources in terms of the, the hospital. So over the last uh, two years, these are the documents that have been published on the Getting It Right First Time. So you don't need to look at the website, just Google in Gerft uh, Urology Academy and you'll, it, you'll come to all these particular things. And one I'd like to reference here is outpatient procedure codes. So it's hugely important that we have, our decisions are underpinned by uh, good information. And if we're not recording what it is we're doing, it's difficult for us to make the case to get the adequate amount of resources to underpin our activity. So it's really important that in terms of outpatient activity that it does get coded. So there's a whole coding section there. So these are the, these are the documents, uh, a little, uh, little more here. So we've done it on acute stone management, bladder outflow obstruction, outpatient transformation, and bladder cancer. Uh, and the final one, which I didn't mention then, was one that's just been published in relation to uh, renal, renal cancer, uh, which has just come out prior to BAUS. And then we're producing one that will come out this month on uh, urology area networks. So what about the next steps then for, for GERFT? Well, as I said to you, the advice and guidance and is going to come out later, later, later this year, uh, allied with generic template letters and intelligent triage. I think there will be an increasing emphasis on virtual consultations and our trust need to be wired up in order to enable us to deliver that. Huge avoidance in terms of routine follow-ups. We need to think very carefully about why patients are being followed up and whether it's necessary. Uh, PIFU, as I've mentioned, and then the rise of community diagnostic hubs. As, as patients move, uh, we need the support of our general practice. and We can't overload our general practice colleagues with, with, uh, with shifting patients around. So we need a new stratagem in terms of how we're going to deliver that. And finally, prostate cancer pathway. So Caroline Moore, we've asked Caroline Moore, who's a professor at uh, University College Hospital in, uh, in London, uh, to look at the prostate cancer pathways. There was a document produced by Vijay Sangar and colleagues going back about a year, year and a half, which really didn't get much, much traction. Uh, but essentially, this guidance is, will mandate the straight-to-test MR for suitable patients and then LATP in an office setting. But we also need to have some guidance in relation to those patients with a normal or equivocal MR. What happens to those patients? And I can tell you what happens to those patients nationally at the moment is a mess. Some of these patients have been discharged and said to get a PSA. Other patients are being followed up for a long period of time, consuming, consuming a lot of resources. So lots of inappropriate referral in secondary care. So clear guidance in terms of discharge uh, to uh, general practice for pyrids 1 and 2 and where the PSA density is normal. Uh, we've also asked Caroline to look at the treatment end of pathway guidance on the low uh, intermediate uh, prostate cancer. And that's really in the light of Freddie Hamdy's publication in the New England Journal of Medicine showing no survival benefit after 15 years um, for patients in, in those groups uh, with radiotherapy or radical prostatectomy. And then the follow-up for men finally in relation to 
uh, those men treated with prostate cancer, including PIFU and remote monitoring. The other thing that will come out later this year will be the urgent and emergency care, because as I indicated earlier, lots of urology units are under uh, pressure with regard to their numbers uh, and making their emergency rotas work. So we need to have better protocols for moving patients across, across the patch from one hospital to another. So in conclusion then, uh, the visits in England are now complete. We've now moved to uh, Scotland and to Wales, and I've recently visited Northern Ireland. Uh, the workforce is a major consideration for us moving forward, and we need, we need big infrastructural changes, both in terms of our personnel and uh, the space that we, we work in. Finally, data drives change, so we must keep abreast of all these issues uh, moving forward. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kieran. Uh, what I'd like to do is not take questions now, but, but form a panel uh, after Alex and Molly have spoken because there'll be some overlap of questions. I've, I've got loads of questions for you, Kieran. I'm sure there'll be loads in the room. There's real tour de force there of data, really around the structure of your units and what we need to do for cancer patients going forward. So have a think about that. Write down your questions, and we'll quiz Kieran on them shortly. If that's all right, Kieran, just take a seat. So next up, Alex Riley's going to... With that backdrop, tell us what the Pathway Board is focusing on uh, this year. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just going to move this up. Okay, so thank you everybody and um, welcome to today and thank you all for coming. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. I am Alex Riley and I'm the Pathway Board Manager at Great Manchester Cancer and I cover esophagogastric cancer, sarcoma and of course urology. Um, now as Dave mentioned earlier, unfortunately Scott isn't able to attend, um, so I am presenting this on his behalf today. So do bear with me because I am nowhere near as good at this as he is. Um, so first of all, we'd like to give you a quick overview of the Urology Pathway Board, our plans for 2023-24, um, and some information about the Pathway Board in general. Now, before I started at GM Cancer, I didn't know very much about the Pathway Boards and the work that they did. Um, so for those of you that are in the same boat as me, um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we do. So the aim of the Urology Pathway Board is to lead and deliver the development of services for urology cancer patients and contribute to the delivery of the NHS long-term plan and the priorities detailed in the annual operation and all planning guidance. Um, the board represents the interests of local people with cancer and it's supported through a work program that drives improvement in clinical care, reducing morbidity and mortality, putting patients at the centre of care services and improving patient experience. The Pathway Board is made up of multiple members. Um, so just a few of those include PPIE managers, allied health professionals, our early diagnosis team, cancer services managers, commissioners, our personalised care teams, workforce and education teams, <coughs> CNSs, oncology, research teams, radiology, pathology, vascular diagnosis, primary care reps, and secondary care reps from each trust. Um, there are other members of the board as well that aren't on that list. We are made up of a whole host of uh, people across the Greater Manchester. Um, as a board, we're ultimately accountable to the Greater Manchester Cancer Board um, and the ICB, and this is just a, a structure that shows what we follow um, and our boards are also supported by subgroups and our small communities as well. Uh, so each year we develop a work programme in line with the NHS long term plan and the work programme split into multiple subgroups including early diagnosis and prevention, faster diagnosis and operational improvement, treatments and care, patient engagement, involvement and experience of care, research and workforce and education. 
So I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of some of the pieces of work that we've got going on in each of those work streams this year and some of the things that we hope to achieve. Um, so first of all, with early diagnosis and prevention, um, our current target is that by 2028, all cancers will be diagnosed at stages one and two. And in order to achieve this target, some of the things that we'll need to look at um, and think about is promoting awareness and reducing health inequalities. And as a board, we'll be running a few initiatives this year, including this van can, which most of you will be aware of and is where SOT is this morning. Um, this is a national pilot whereby a mobile van will travel across Greater Manchester and offer PSA tests to black men over the age of 45 and men over the age of 50 with a family history of prostate cancer. And alongside the van, we'll also be conducting awareness and educational events to communities, including at-risk groups. We'll be running a public awareness campaign on hematuria, working with our Gateway C colleagues and our academy team with GM Cancer. We'll be running webinars for primary care colleagues discussing PSA testing, the assessment of hematuria, bladder and renal cancer, and penile cancer. We'll also be working alongside our primary care colleagues to look at developing um, clinical decision-making tools to support assessment and onward referral. Now, next up, we've got our faster diagnosis and operational improvement. Um, and our national target is that 75% of cancers will be diagnosed by day 28. And we've got a few work streams going on this year to help us achieve this standard in a sustainable way. Um, so these include centralised and protocolised MR reporting. Um, we'll be hosting a prostate best practice time pathway workshop where we'll be reviewing um, what has been achieved so far, celebrating um, achievements, sharing best practice and creating action plan to aid improvements. We'll be looking at bladder pathway improvements to see where we can streamline our processes there. We have established the transurethral laser ablation service, our Tula service, um, and we'll be looking to do some work to ensure that that's running effectively. Um, part of our prostate best practice time pathway workshop, it has been mandated that we need to report on um, the best practice time pathway milestone compliance. Um, so along with our BI teams, we'll be looking at where we are with that, reporting on that data so we can get um, more finite data um, to see where we need to make improvements in our pathway. Um, we're looking to establish a nurse-led um, LATP biopsy service and offer training to our nurses across Greater Manchester and ensuring that there are ring-fenced MPMRI slots prior to biopsy. Um, for treatment and care alongside our personalised care team, we'll be creating a patient patient stratified follow-up, HNAs and personalised care support plans and standardised treatment summaries. Uh, we'll be re-establishing our health and wellbeing services across Greater Manchester and creating a genomics pathway um, as well. We also received tumour site review recommendations and we will be reviewing these and seeing where we can adopt these into our pathways. Now, a huge part of our work is supported by our service users. So this year, we aim to promote our urology small community and ensure that our patient representatives all play a part in the projects that we have running. Um, their voice is vital to this work. Uh, there's so much going on with research across Greater Manchester. Um, I've not named anywhere near as much as what we do have going on out there. But from the Pathway Board point of view, We'll be looking at a remote PSA sampling project, which is the use of a micro sampling device that patients can use at home to monitor their PSA, um, uh, PSA as part of their surveillance um, to avoid them having to come into hospital um, and have their blood drawn there. And we'll also be looking to publish evaluation reports on the prostate cancer case finding pilot and the TULA service. Now, finally, we've got our workforce and education um, team who we work very closely with, with GM, and they, we, we will work with them to offer the educational event, which we are running today. Um, we will be piloting a PA blended role, hosting webinars, supporting the GM-wide CNS Away Day, um, an MDT reform project, holding a catheterization skills lab, uh, producing incontinence modules and of course the LATP biopsy training that we're going to be offering to our nurses. 
Uh, now that was a really quick overview of just some of the work that we'll be carrying out this year. Um, I must be clear though that this work is only achievable with the hard work of the members of the board and the wider groups um, across the sector, our small communities, patient representatives, and of course, everybody that's involved in the urology pathway itself. Um, so if anybody has any questions about the pathway board or the work that we have, um, that we carry out throughout the year or in future or past as well, then please do feel free to get in touch with myself and Sot and we'll be able to help. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Some absolutely fantastic work going on. I mean, it's absolutely enormous, isn't it, the, the work going on. This three that leapt out at me um, was the This Band Can, of course, um, where Sot is today, uh, leading on that nationally. The nurse-led um, prostate biopsy service would be absolutely fantastic if we can broaden out that offer to other, other professionals. Um, and then the PSA testing, patients being able to do that at home, that would be absolutely fantastic, wouldn't it? And then post the, post the blood off uh, for analysis. That would really be a game changer. Thanks very much, Alex, for that. So finally in this session, before we bring the three speakers to the front, is Molly. She's going to tell us about the Academy with respect to urology cancer. Thanks very much, Molly. Thank you, Dave. Perfect. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, just thank you so much for being here. Um, this is the first event that we've done under the urology umbrella, so it's great to see so many of you here today. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know me, Molly Pipping, I'm the Senior Programme Lead for Education at Greater Manchester Cancer Alliance, uh, and I head up our Cancer Academy. So today I think there's probably variations in terms of level of knowledge around what the Academy is. Um, but hopefully I can answer some of the queries and questions that Kieran brought up as part of the Getting It Right First Time report as well. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, what is the Cancer Academy? Well, our vision is to support um, the development of a sustainable lifelong learning model for our workforce, and that's across all care settings, really to make sure that we can meet the current and future needs of our population. So this is about making sure that we're equipping our workforce with the skills and tools necessary to deliver that best patient care. And of course, everything that we do talks to the long-term plan and the NHS people plan ambitions for cancer services. And one of the beauties of having an academy um, as a backbone as that education arm of the Cancer Alliance is that it reduces that inequity around access to cancer education. And it's a great vehicle for us to standardise offerings and reduce that postcode lottery that we so often talk about around patient care. I think one of the USPs for the Academy is that we're driven by workforce need. We don't want to tell people what they need to know. We want to hear from you, the people on the floor doing the jobs. Where are the, where are the gaps in terms of what you need to know about? So over the past 18 months, we have been in phase one, where we've been finding out what our model is, if it's transferable, um, and that is what is on the right-hand side or the left-hand side there. Um, so that's what it looks like, and I'll talk through this model a little bit more as I move through the rest of the slides. But I think what I really wanted to highlight here is that we're taking a one cancer workforce approach to this. We keep hearing around the value of our workforce and we can only continue to deliver the best patient care if we have a well-resourced and educated workforce at that. So we're working really collegiately with other partners across Greater Manchester, such as Gateway C, the School of Oncology and MASC, to bring all of these entities together and really be that one-stop shop for cancer education. So... Phase two is where we're at now. So we've just come out of pilot phase, um, where, as I said, we've been testing our model within the urology specialty. Um, but we don't like to do things by halves at the Cancer Alliance. So we now have 19 cancer academies, um, all of which will have a deliverable before the end of this financial year. So the program has grown drastically um, and there's a lot of things on there. So all 14 uh, cancer pathways have their own academy. Then there's some cross-cutting ones in there as well, such as uh, teenagers and young adults and the uh, paediatric boards as part of the operational delivery network. Uh, the Greater Manchester Cancer Conference also comes under this portfolio of work. And again, all of the personalised care and early diagnosis elements fit into this as well. 
So obviously operationalizing something that's gone from one pathway to 19 is quite extravagant. So we've expanded our team accordingly and I'm sure there's some familiar faces on this slide, um, but a lot of very new people. So an area that we're really starting to develop over the next 12 months is working with our community and social care sectors. And uh, Dr. Steve Churchill is our clinical lead for that and will be really driving that forwards to make sure that we're bolstering that engagement. So to take a step back and where we started with urology and some of the themes that Kieran talked to, we know that we've got an aging population who have enhanced urological needs. And we've also got the lowest ratio of urologists per head of any G20 nation. So it's really important that we scale up our workforce, both in terms of numbers, but also clinical competencies. So starting with urology as the academy, which transcends all care settings and not just people who are specialist, but also generalist, is a great starting point for us. So we conducted a training needs analysis in tandem with the University of Salford to figure out what our workforce looked like across Greater Manchester, where the gaps were in knowledge and where we could really plug those. And that brings me to where we are at the moment and the offers that you could go away and access today if you needed any more education on any of these areas. So the first one, and again, this is back to our blended learning approach, some modules that sit on our website, free at the point of access, and you can go and dip in and out of at any point, all CPD accredited. So we've got two modules on hematuria, which Kieran authored. So thank you, Kieran, for that. I've got some data from that that I can show you in a second. And we've also got a module on Chula and flexible cystoscopy. So in light of Alex Hoyle not being here this afternoon, if anyone does want to learn more about it, then uh, you can go to the academy and do that education. We've also been working with a pharmaceutical company uh, to create a 10-part prostate cancer pathway module, which will be live on the website before the end of July. And then something that's really exciting and very new on our website is some content that we've done in conjunction with Manchester Metropolitan University. So this sits on their open access platform, which is called Burley Place, which is a virtual world. And Struan, who's one of our urology trainees, has supported this. So thank you, Struan, for all of your help and commitment to that. Um, but again, a great resource, and it covers three different areas. So from your catheter care, your very basics that maybe community and social care staff might need to know, through to, again, more junior staff might need to know about anatomy and pathophysiology. So great resources there. But we've been nearly 12 months since we launched, so we need to start seeing a little bit of impact from what we're doing. And we've started to get some really rich data through on this. So 62 people have come through and completed our first module on hematuria. Um, and from the TNA that we did with the University of Salford, we can roughly figure out that around 34% of our workforce across Greater Manchester, who this is relevant to, have accessed the training. So that's fantastic to see that it's starting to get out there and make some headway um, and have a bit of a difference. And there's just um, a graph here at the bottom as well, which demonstrates the impact of confidence pre and post learning. So we've seen a shift from 20% of confidence before the training to 80% afterwards. So great to see that it's really benefiting those people. Over the next 12 months, as Alex said in her presentation as well, we're creating some uh, continence management modules, which again are geared more towards community and social care staff, which will be released very soon. Webinars, so another type of our blended learning approach, so something that's quick, short, snappy, 90-minute sessions. We've done two of these so far, one on bladder cancer and one on testicular, both which are available on demand. But in terms of live attendees, we've had 151 people access these webinars, um, with 13 out of the 21 cancer alliances across England joining into them. So word is really getting out there, and I think it's great that even though we're thinking about our Greater Manchester workforce, that these can be accessed nationally and they're having a different they're making a difference interesting as well in terms of the sectors that we're starting to tap into again I think this aligns with what Kieran talked around no surprise that secondary care is the biggest hitter in terms of where we're getting our audience from but it is really great to see that primary care community and social are starting to trickle through that with a few students also in attendance and again, impact, I won't read through all of these, but I suppose to summarise, it's great to see that people are taking the learning away from those webinars and going and putting them into practice. Someone who said she didn't know that she could refer the patient to the Christie for a conversation before consultation. Someone else who didn't know about the different types of blood tests that you could do for testicular cancer and fed that back internally to see if they could change their service. 
Uh, and a skills lab concept. So this, again, is something that really sets us apart from other academies that are established. And this is where our staff can come and get hands-on practical skills that are tangible and they can go and put into practice. So what we identified was that catheterization and catheter care was a big need as part of that training needs analysis we conducted, uh, predominantly across community and social care settings. So we've operationalized a skills lab and we delivered our first one last week with a care home in Tameside, where a couple of healthcare assistants came down and had a look at what the anatomy looks like and they put together, um, again, the graph which you can see on the left there. Um, this is really exciting though, this piece of work, we've just secured a significant amount of funding from the Greater Manchester Social Care Academy to roll this out further, where we'll be upskilling 1,300 staff who work in social care. So a real big win for us and something that will go towards making a huge difference, maybe people that maybe present in uh, emergency service settings or needing to call out a district nurse. I can't talk about all of this education without speaking about our workforce and re really retaining them. We know that we've got an issue, especially with our clinical nurse specialist workforce. So something that I think is really gonna start making headway towards this is the ASCEND framework. And I know that frameworks have been done to death over the past few years, but I think that this one is something that's very different. It's been through a really robust consultation process. Um, and I think it's part of this culture shift that we're going to start seeing. But ASCEND stands for Aspirant Cancer Career and Education Development Programme. And this is an end-to-end -end career framework. It's multi-professional, taking you through all the way from your supportive and assistive workforce, such as your cancer support workers, all the way through to those people who want to be ACP's consultant level nurses as well. So a real fantastic mechanism that we've got here that can now underpin our workforce and really enhance their career trajectory, but they can now also take the, their own power back into their hands and look at what gaps they need to plug to progress. So we've gone one step further than the Ascend framework, which is a 96 page document, um, and we've made it urology specific. So our clinical practice educator, Gina, um, won't just have done this for urology now, but she'll be doing it for all pathways that we have at the Alliance. And this now sits on our e-portfolio. Um, so our Greater Manchester Cancer Academy professional development platform. So the framework is hosted here. It signposts out to loads of other education, not just on a Greater Manchester level, but nationally, and it maps to all of the capabilities. Uh, we're also working with Born and uh, Prostate Cancer UK to make sure that we're aligned with everything that they offer as well. Uh, and it's all incorporated as part of here. So if anyone's done some of the courses on the Prostate Cancer UK website, you can come on here and transfer your learning across. It tracks the number of CPD hours you've done. It helps with your appraisals, but also any revalidation processes that you'd like to go through as well. So again, just because I've mentioned Ascend, I can't talk about that with just without mentioning psychological level two and Pod's in the room, so he'll be glad that I'm talking about this as well. Um, but we know that demand outweighs capacity for level two training. Um, it's a big issue um, that we know that we've got across Greater Manchester. Um, and Ascend has now stipulated that as well as CNS is requiring this training, all allied health professionals who are operating um, at an enhanced or advanced level also require it. So we've got an even bigger issue that we need to start tackling. So previously we've delivered this training as a two day face to face course with our psychologists and counsellors across Manchester really supporting the delivery of this. But we've all got workforce pressures and we also need to find new sustainable ways of working. So we've taken the two day model and we've created a hybrid approach. So five parts online consolidated by one full day of face to face training. Uh, and we've done two sessions of this so far uh, with an additional seven booked in before the end of the year. Um, and the hope is that we can get 200 of our staff through level two over the next 12 months, which in itself would be a massive achievement and the largest number that we've done over the past five years that we've commissioned this training. But we know that we've still got a long way to go. We've seen some barriers already starting to emerge, such as the lack of advanced communication skills, which is a prerequisite. So we know that we need to do more around that, the Alliance, but also around clinical supervision. 
And we would never advocate for anyone coming on this training who doesn't have supervision in place, but it also doesn't negate the need for the training. So it's something that is part of the workforce team and we sit within that portfolio of work and they'll be looking at that over the next 12 months as well. Uh, but I would just really encourage you to go and share this um, back with any colleagues who require the training uh, because it is a really fantastic course and again, already been rated very highly. Um, the Ascend team are very interested in this um, and it's looking like that it could be rolled out on a national basis as well. So great that Greater Manchester um, has led the way with that one. And I suppose for anyone who isn't at the point where they need level two training or just someone who wants some more training around having inclusive conversations, I just wanted to end on this note. So we do a lot of work with other external partners um, and one of the partners that we've worked with over the past few months is the LGBT Foundation. And we did a survey around what cancer support workers specifically needed more training around. And it came out that they wanted to be able to have more inclusive conversations with patients from the LGBTQ plus community, uh, but also more empowering conversations. They didn't want to feel like they were treading on eggshells and we hadn't equipped them with any knowledge or education to be able to do that. So these modules are really fantastic and um, it's our highest highest uh, tip participated module that's on the academy website it's only been out for three weeks and we've had over 100 people complete it already and um, again all free at the point of access but i would really encourage anyone in this room to go and do it it's great for all levels even though um, it was originally come from by cancer support workers uh, but if you have any other questions then i know that we've got a panel but we've got a few social media channels obviously the website's there please go and have a look at it um, and take this opportunity to invest in yourself in your education as well Thank you. Right, fantastic. I'm really proud um, of all the work going on in urology um, as a urologist. Uh, but obviously, I work across all cancer areas, but urology is really punching above its weight. And it's great to have national figures like Kieran who are able to, to tell us what we need to be doing and also some great work uh, going on the pathway board and that Molly's helping support. Can we have our three panellists up at the front? Sorry, Alex, to bring you up. Um, you've got a microphone there, have you? Have we got a roving mic? So really want some questions from the floor. I'm gonna warm the, the panel up, if we can, with a, a, a question. First to Kieran. Um, primary care and GERFT, where, where does that feature? I know Liam's in here, I'm sure he's desperate for me to ask that. I don't think it's really got off the ground yet, but there are certainly plans for it to get off the ground in terms of looking at how GP practice is, is configured and what it will be delivering moving forward. And also trying to do away with, in terms of change, um, this dichotomy between primary care and secondary care. Because we, I think we have significant issues in terms of partnership at the moment. We're just not working as well together as we might be. We can't on the one hand, uh, continue to get the same number of um, referrals moving forward into secondary care, and on the other hand, try to push stuff back into primary care when primary care are already hugely, hugely pressurized. So we need to really look at models for how primary and secondary care are going to work together collaboratively in the future. Um, uh, Liam, are you able to, to comment? Um, yeah, no, th thanks for, for asking, Dave. I was um, itching to ask that question myself, actually, and, and thank you, Kieran, for acknowledging I think the pressures that primary care are under, um, because I, I think it is a very difficult place to be in at the moment. Um, I think there possibly are opportunities, aren't about sort of developing sort of shared models of, of, of case management, for example. So let's just take PSA monitoring as, as, as one um, theme. It is something I think could sit reasonably well within primary care, but perhaps the resource would need to flow into primary care to do that, to do it effectively and safely. So it's dead, dead easy for me as a GP to set up a system in my own surgery to say, do Mr. Smith's PSA every six months, for example. What happens if that patient moves somewhere else in Greater Manchester, then we lose that ability in my surgery. It needs to be more a strategic approach. I guess there's other things that we could think about developing as well. And I think just interesting from the, some of the stats you said right at the start there about the number of referrals into urology and how many people actually needed something doing, be it operation or procedure. And there's an awful lot of opportunity to, I think, perhaps base some urology services or care within primary care networks, for example, where people perhaps don't need to see 
the specialist in inverted commas but maybe have some degree of expertise you know at, at a primary care level to help manage certain conditions before they sort of progress up into a secondary or tertiary setting so i think there's there's possible opportunities there but um i'd agree it would probably at a very early stage I, I guess of developing that yeah thanks and uh, um any questions out there while you warming up strewing you must have a question but just a technical one, Kieran. The, you spoke about the urology area networks. So, so tell colleagues, if you can, a, what, what, where are they in Greater Manchester? They really haven't got off the ground formally. Okay, so nationally, there are 42, 44 area networks. Um, for us in Salford, our area network is really across Pennine because we have a population probably 1.2, 1.4, 1.4 million, whichever way, you, whichever way you cut it. Central Manchester would be in with Whittenshaw, and then Stockport would be to the south with, with allied hospitals down there. But the fundamental concept between urology area networks is this understanding that many hospitals are overcooked with regard to cancer provision, so we know that uh, nationally. So if I used an example outside Manchester, Leicester have been overcooked for some time in relation to their ability to do uh, radical prostatectomy, cystectomy, and various forms of renal surgery with patients waiting long periods of time. And as a consequence of forming a network, the uh, University Hospital of Lincolnshire have actually put in a robot. And rather than patients going into Leicester to have their surgery, more and more of the surgery is being delivered outside. In Norfolk, for example, they also have a very functioning area network. So Kings Lynn uh, and other hospitals are developing their expertise in relation to bladder outflow surgery and, and stone management. And the idea really behind this is to try and rebalance services and to give people a raison d'etre to uh, work not merely in the center, but also in peripheral hospitals as well. Because unless we move down that route and rebalance services, increasingly hospitals trying to provide urology services will have difficulty recruiting nurses and medics to, to do that, and as a consequent risk falling over. So as I mentioned in my, in my talk, a key component of this is to try and stabilize urology services and to make sure that there isn't a postcode lottery. And the emerging examples that are in the academy really relate to the prime example is bladder outflow obstruction. So much bladder outflow obstruction surgery can now be delivered either on a, um, as a day case basis or an overnight stay. And there's no real reason for having it in a major tertiary center when it could be safely delivered elsewhere by an expert team delivering all the modalities. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Any, anyone brave enough? Not yet. So let me, let me turn to Alex. Uh, I don't know if this is an unfair question. Uh, but just as a prelude, a warmer for this lunch. So some of the pivotal work um, SOT's been leading on is this van can. Could you just, just very briefly tell us what that's all about? It's about prostate cancer, case finding, is it? What, what exactly is it? Where, where, where is this van going? What SOT and colleagues, nurses and doctors doing on that van? Yeah, um, so, sorry. <laughs> The, the aim of the van is to go around to all of the areas across Greater Manchester um, and target the areas where we know we have high-risk patients that are likely to develop prostate cancer. Um, so stats show us that uh, black men over the age of 45 are at a higher risk. They're a one in four risk um, of developing prostate cancer. Um, uh, but they're also less likely to come to their GPs um, with symptoms um, or to discuss PSA testing. Um, so the van is there to promote the awareness in the communities um, as well as offering a PSA test um, to the patients as well. Um, so trying to reduce some of that burden on our primary care settings um, as well as um, ensuring that patients have access um, to education um, and understanding and to discuss their concerns that they might have. Um, so it's a nationally funded pilot. Um, it is happening across three alliances um, across um, England and we, we hope to, have some, to see some good results from it and maybe steer the way in terms of how we do 
uh, campaigns, awareness campaigns, and how we promote things in future. Yeah, so it's going well so far, the, the appointments? It is. Know. It's been extremely popular, much more popular than we expected it to be, to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's, that, it's that bit that I like particularly is about people going out into the communities rather than sitting in your hospital base and just waiting for people to come to you, yeah. getting out there and, and driving that service and making sure it's getting the right patients and doing the, yeah. the right thing. It's attracted a lot of attention, yeah. Um, yeah. And we're definitely seeing the right patients coming through those van doors, which has been great. And we'll see what the people think, make of it at lunchtime, won't we? Uh, yep. Yeah. So finally, um, I'll have to walk around with a microphone at the, the next panel discussion and pick on some people. Um, so Molly, um, really interested, uh, a couple of questions for you, Molly, and I guess the answer to the first question is probably behind you, but how do people here find out about the modules and, and what they can do? So there were people who want to develop their career and thinking, well, what can I do? What skills can I develop in my urology practice? Where will they go? Yep, absolutely. So our website is up on the screen behind me. So it's just www.gmcanceracademy.org.uk. Um, when you go to the site, you can create a free account and it will ask you to specify what your preferences are in terms of your specialty. So you can select urology from that list. So we don't spam you with all of the other offers that we've got coming out. Um, and it will tailor that to your level of practice as well. So it just fill in the form and then we'll email you things and then um, you'll get notifications as well. Yeah, so my final question before we go for a break um, kind of merges what Alex was talking about on the pathway board and also the academy. So not yet operational, but nurse led um, prostate biopsy service that's an aspiration, something the academy could support. Um, let's say for some nurses out there who are quite interested in developing that skill, how would the academy, how would that work in practice, uh, say in a year's time? Yeah. yeah, so that's something that we're actively involved in very much, so working with Alex and also the faster diagnosis team. So if there are any nurses out there who would like the training, then please do just get in touch with either myself or Alex. Um, we're working with Edge Hill University, who currently offer the accredited module on LATP biopsies. Um, and we do have some funded places that we can put you through um, and give you all of the various details in terms of the competency sign off and the legacy around that as well. So just get in touch if anyone is interested. Okay. Right. If you can join me in thanking our three panelists for this session this morning. Um, hopefully they'll all hang around. You may have questions for one of the panelists um, uh, in the coffee break. Are you hanging around, Kieran? Yeah, excellent. I know the other two are. Yeah. So if we can, let's reconfigure. So if we can meet at um, 11.35, back in the room. So about half past 11, start making your way back. We've got some snacks outside, plus coffee, all free. Go and enjoy yourself and see the rep stand. Thanks. <laughs>